Hey everybody, I'm Allison Miller. Nice to see you. I'm on Twitter as Selena Kyle, if any of you are kind of following hashtag BrewCon. And I'm very pleased to be here. So this is actually my second time uh, at BrewCon. I love this room, it's amazing. So as folks are kind of filtering in, let's really put this room to use. How are you guys feeling about the energy in here? I'm from California, so I get to say things like that in a non-ironic way. So I kind of feel like the energy's at like a four. How about we try and like get it up to like at least a six before we get started? Oh, I like this, hands up, hands up. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. I, um, <clears throat> hands still up, hands still up. So what some of my friends here know is that in addition to being an information security superstar, I am also licensed to jazz hand, yeah. So today we're gonna do something a little bit different for the keynote. I really like things that are a little more interactive and discussion based. Um, so in the past I have made folks who have come to my discussion sessions sing. We won't do that today. I might do that, but you guys don't need to do that. I've made people dance, you don't need to do that. But you might need to do a little acting, okay? So, hands up again, let's see. All right, okay, we are, all right, now hands slightly out to the side. Let's imagine we're creating a perimeter, okay? This is our secure space. We've created a perimeter around, right? Outside of time, outside of space. Imagine there's a fire right here. Did, is there a fire coming? I did request having some sort of like fire in the center. Did that, oh, it didn't come through. Okay, all right, well, imagine, just like focus your hacker powers. Oh, <laughs> woo -hoo. Thank you for that. Okay, so with that in mind, I think we're gonna unplug. You guys ready? This is about to get really strange. Okay. If I can view my own notes, that would be great too. Okay. So probably you all are wondering what, what I was thinking about when I, what, what I had in mind when I wanted to talk to you guys about inventing defense. So confession is that I originally wanted to talk about reinventing defense and I was really excited to come talk to you about uh, some of the things that I'm seeing working on very large uh, intrusion detection type systems. I do a lot of detection systems, large scale systems that leverage behavior analysis. So I was gonna big data you, machine learning you, throw some algorithms your way and talk about some of the trends that I'm seeing in defense. But then I was having a conversation with someone and they asked me a question that kind of blew my mind and kind of ruined my day. It was a very simple question. This was the question. The question was, how has defense changed since you started your career? And I was thinking about that. I was thinking, wow, when I started my career, uh, I didn't consider myself defense. I did some help desk time, any former sysadmins in the house, IT analysts, and suddenly my job description started sprouting security, but we were making it up as we were going along. How many of you, how many of you are former sysadmins or help desk folks? And then you got conscripted over to security because you had some kind of frame of mind or frame of reference where you just wanted to start defending things. So let's see. So what I, what I kind of realized as I was considering this question um, how things have changed is that maybe we're not done inventing defense because we're still kind of making it up as we go. And so while I do feel like there are some next gen things coming, technology and approaches that we can tap into, I really don't feel like we're done with the first version of inventing defense. I mean, uh, so, so in addition to like sysadmins and, and system analysts and architects, we've got auditors and compliance folks who sort of switched laterally into this. And basically what we have now is we kind of have a loose alliance of fun, some folks who consider themselves information security professionals, some people who are just happily kind of hacker enthusiasts. Come on in, come on in. 
sit in the second row. Sit close to the front. Come over here. Someone, someone wants to sit over here. It's, you're totally not going to get called on if you sit over here. You're, you're safer if you sit here. I'm looking over here. Okay, so we have a loose alliance of folks who are sort of quasi-affiliated with InfoSec. And that's kind of what we, we now have come to expect when we see a security team. You can kind of think of some of the roles, like security engineer or uh, folks who are doing forensics and IR. And then, and then we have the CISO type. So the CISO type is basically kind of like an InfoSec Voltron, right? They sort of grab from all these different disciplines and then they rise up the ladder and they're, all, all of the things that we need to be doing in security are aggregated into one person. So that isn't really, though, a satisfying response to um, what is defense and where did defense come from. I kind of believe that we are the stories that we tell ourselves. So when I think about defense, anyone have any stories that spring to mind when you think about defense? Here's a few. Let's see if any of these resonate. Oh, security. That's a cost center. That's where we spend money. We don't make money there. And the business doesn't understand. They don't take security seriously. They don't, they don't understand what we're trying to do. How about risk, being able to identify the assets and kind of understand what's at risk, quantifying that, super tough. We've got the whole red team versus blue team dynamic, who has it easier, who is more heroic, who's more inventive. Then uh, one, one of my favorites that I think is really useful is assume compromise, right? Design your defenses assuming that a compromise is gonna happen. And then, Another, so we just established this nice perimeter, right? Remember when everyone built everything around this idea that they were gonna have this super solid perimeter? I call it the bullseye zone, right? Once you have that perimeter, you're just sort of sitting there like a bullseye. And that's often how we feel as defenders, that if we step forward, we're basically just painting a bullseye on our back. Of course, you know, n not everyone uh, markets themselves as impermeable or um, completely perfect, but that's kind of what we're looking at. And then a lot of these ideas kind of crystallize in something that folks call the defender's dilemma. Have any of you heard that concept? I think it kind of summarizes as, like, let, me, let me know if, if, if this resonates. Defense has to be perfect all of the time forever. You establish this perimeter and you got your arms around the system and you can't slip for one second. You can't make one mistake because offense, they only have to find one way in and they win. By the way, I hate that concept. I hate whoever designed that game. How does that make sense that, that you have to win, 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 win forever and never make a mistake, but someone else can get kind of like one in, one point, one vulnerable point, and then you failed. And that's, that's a lot of what the burden that defenders kind of take on. We're stressed, sleep deprived, always on call. A lot of folks may have imposter syndrome, and we're constantly under attack, which by the way, doesn't just make you a defender, it kind of makes you defensive psychologically. On the other hand though, we love it. I mean, there's a lot of great aspects of being in defense. Uh, we got a lot of adrenaline junkies. They're always up for a challenge. They don't mind always being under attack. They're ready. They want to see the next thing come. They're puzzle hunters. They're scrappy. They're innovative. They're willing to work with duct tape and bailing wire and make it work. We're adaptable to changing environments, which is key. And while we're good at saying no, we're looking out for our peeps. So, if we are the stories that we tell ourselves, which I believe we are, what I wonder is, do we have useful stories? Do we have stories that resonate? Do we see ourselves in our stories? Can those stories help us grow? And anyone like behavioral economics, like a little thinking fast and slow, a little Kahneman and Tversky? Do we have the right frame on our stories? Like, not just is the timeline right, but is the narrative such that that when we tell ourselves our stories, it supports where we want to go. What are our origin myths? The origin myth of the hacker is kind of easy to, to lay your hands on, right? From a little kid, you took things apart, you reprogrammed the VCR, oh, DVR, 
I, I don't know if any of you remember VCRs at this point, but you, you sort of took, what's that? Betamax, okay, cool. Cool, Betamax, yes, indeed. Um, that, was, that, was, that was Sony's entree. So, uh, <clears throat> so the origin myth of hackers is kind of easy to put a thumb on, it's what we all live with, but where is that impulse that makes one a defender to protect? So what I thought we might do, are you guys still into this? Yes, you're totally into this, is that we might look to stories from other places and see if there's things that we can learn from them or that they can teach us or that we can, we can adopt. Okay, so what we're going for here, or we're going for some good like origin myth stories of defenders. Because I don't want to talk about defense, I don't want to talk about the technology of defense right now. I kind of, what I'm interested in is I'm interested in us. And whether you're red team or blue team, I kind of consider you guys, everybody, everybody is part of this, this journey. So, hence, the, now the audience participation really starts. So we're going to start with a trial or a battle. Okay, all right, are you guys ready? I'm going to need... Two volunteers, one from this side, one from this side. Just like stand up when you're ready. Or I'm gonna come get you. So someone on the aisle, stand up. And you guys split down right in the middle in teams. You guys are one team, you guys are one team. Let me get some folks over here screaming for your team. Say yeah. <sighs> All right, you heard what they had to bring to bear. What do you guys have? Okay, so the scene. We're in a desert. There's cliffs. You guys are engaged in a battle, and you are at a stalemate. So you're all kind of hiding in your spots, okay? Where are my volunteers? Are you standing up? I think you might be the volunteer, sir, holding your jacket. Are you ready? Are you ready to, to work here? All right. Are you ready? Why don't you go? Yeah, all right. Awesome. <laughs> And over here, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, to your corners. Okay, so this is an ancient battle, there's a stalemate, what's gonna happen? What the two sides decide is that they will each send out one warrior, okay? And they're gonna do a cage match. A little bit of MMA right here in the round, okay? And whoever wins the cage match, wins the battle. The other side is just gonna fold. Are you guys gonna fold? You guys, you guys are gonna win, right? All right, how about you guys? Are you guys gonna take that? No, okay, all right, are you guys ready? Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I wish I had the hammock right now. Okay, in this corner, we have weighing in at, I don't know, like many, many kilos, a ton. The guy weighs a ton. He's seven feet tall. Please welcome Goliath. Walk very slowly down the stairs. Goliath, come on, woo! All right, Goliath is wearing a lot of armor, like many layers of defenses on this guy. This is why he is walking slow. He is armed, he is carrying a huge sword. Yes, that's, yes, actually this is it. This is the sword. And this gentleman right here is carrying his red shield right there, his attendant coming down to carry his shield. All right, in this corner, we have David. Come on, David. So these folks, David is, comes from shepherd stock, a young, slight man who has basically nothing better to do with his life than volunteer, but he's got already, he's canny, and Goliath has his sword, and David, in a shocking surprise, instead of running away, which some folks were expecting, David pulls out his slingshot, sling, oh gee whiz, come on now, family friendly, slingshot, and bam, right between the eyes, oh, David's team wins. <laughs> hold on, hold on. We're going to rewind. We're going to re rewind, rewind. Back up to the top for a second. Okay. So that is the, so the way that we look at the David, Goliath, David and Goliath myth is framed as the underdog wins. Goliath weighed a ton, seven feet tall, 
you know, trained in battle, has all of this armor ready to go. And over here, David had like no chance at all, slip of a boy, just had a slingshot and some good aim. But actually, uh, Malcolm Gladwell tells the story a little bit differently. So historians have kind of looked at this in a different way. So we're going to redo this with a different, a slightly different frame. Okay, are you guys going to win this time? Yeah, you, you actually kind of know how it ends. But let's give a little bigger of a cheer for, for Goliath. Okay, so out comes Goliath, a very slow, almost blind person who weighs a ton with all this armor who cannot carry his own shield, has an attendant to carry a shield with him. And in these days, what was Goliath expecting? Goliath was expecting the other side to send out a warrior of his type. So he is, let's see, infantry, right? A foot soldier. His strength is the name of the game. It's not about speed, it's about endurance. And basically, Goliath was built for endurance. Defenders, he's basically sitting there, right? With all of his armor, all of his layers of defense, he's just sitting there waiting for the attacker who is going to be someone or his, you know, the person he's going to battle who's going to be just like him. However, David is a well-trained slingshotter. And so actually, actually this, is, this is actually not a game of an underdog winning. This is a game, okay, cheer for David because David's still volunteering but he's not really risking as much as we thought when he was just sort of this young, this young shepherd thrown into the gladiator ring with someone as well trained as Goliath. The thing is, is that this is actually a game of rock, paper, scissors. And here's rock just sitting there. And usually when you play rock, paper, scissors, like let's play a quick game of rock, paper, scissors already. One, two, three. Okay, right? So you both go at the same time. If, if someone puts rock out, what are you going to put out? Paper. So in this battle, what Goliath was expecting was, Goliath was expecting another Goliath. Rock was out here expecting another rock. Right? Instead, here comes rock. Oh, and so of course, they send out paper. Okay, so what's a lesson that we might learn from this as defenders? Was that this? Did you just do this? Okay, that was your, oh yeah, that was your slingshot. Well, actually, I mean, it feels, it, it actually kind of almost feels like, is, oh, all right, that's cool. It's already written in sort of the cyber way, right? Here you are, here's your network, you're just sitting there. You're out there on the internet, completely exposed. And all you have, all that has to happen is one slingshotter needs to have good aim and aim right here in a place that is exposed where you don't have armor on, right? And so, and so the, the thing about rock, paper, scissors, though, is we got rock, we got paper, what's missing? Scissors. So there's actually a third type of uh, campaign, which is actually, and this isn't a plug, the cavalry, the folks on horseback. Why? So because the, why is horseback useful here? It's because they move fast enough and unpredictably enough that a slingshotter couldn't get good aim. So if life sends you a David, if life sends you some paper, maybe we need to be scissors. So actually, I kind of dig on this, and I actually want to think a little bit about how we might make perimeters unpredictable. Wouldn't that be interesting? If our perimeters spun so fast and changed so rapidly that attackers, the slingshotters of the world, couldn't get a good aim. Hmm, that might change the game a little bit. All right, let's give a hand to David and Goliath. You both did wonderfully. Okay. So, oh, and a, another aspect to this that I just want to mention really quick because it is really relevant to defense is the idea of speed. So if you work with any detection system, you know that attackers use speed against you. You need time as a defender to kind of understand what's going on and make a decision. And attackers are able to use that against us, but... If we, as we move forward, we need to figure out as defenders how to make speed our friends too. Okay, ooh, next up we're gonna take a journey. 
We're going to do some archetypes. Okay, this I think everybody is going to play along. Are you ready? Everybody going to play along? Okay. I need you to pick a card, any card. Pick this one. No. Okay. Okay, so what we have here is we have the magician, which is the consummate hacker archetype. So uh, I couldn't figure out how to share these without violating copyright, so we're going to act these out, all right? Everybody get your right hand up, or your left hand, whichever one. Pick a hand. Maybe with a cell phone in it. You don't have to, but just imagine you have a cell phone. Now, imagine you're at a work table, and right here, you have your hand on your wallet. All right. So, or Bitcoin is kind of how I think of it. I think of a cell phone. You're trying to get reception here, and then right here. Okay. So the magician stands at his work table. In one hand, he has a wand that he's going to pull energy down and direct it, manifest his will in the form of material. Yeah, material goodness. Um, so, so literally, the card is the magician is directing energy down to his workbench, which contains, you know, um, things magicians have. So like gold, right? The magician is the alchemist of your you know, whether he was trying to use chemistry or magic, what he's trying to do is direct energy, manifest his will to make change. Hey, that is the hacker ethos right there in one card. Um, so also on, the, also on the table would be some of the other sort of divinatory tools like the chalice, perhaps your coffee, and then also um, maybe some lock picks. It was like a little knife kind of a thing. You got a wand, you got a pentacle, you got the chalice. Okay, so, whoo, oh my gosh, we're getting mystical here. Are you guys getting mystical? Yes. Okay, so the thing about the magician, the thing about that hacker archetype is it's not really a destination card. It's kind of an aspect. That card comes out, you're kind of like, okay, I'm thinking about control, maybe control issues. I'm thinking about, um, you know, having the will to get things done. As you are, if you, come on, hands up. Let's just do this real quick one more time. Okay, you're proud, you're strong, you sort of like open up that chest. You know that you have the ability to do things that others can't, um, which is a really interesting thing, which is a really sort of useful aspect when these, uh, this is used in divination. Fortune tellers really are some of the original social engineers. They use these cards or whatever tools to basically provide a mirror back to whoever they're doing a reading for and uh, tell them what they need to hear. But the, the, so as I said, the magician isn't really a destination card, it's just an aspect. What's really interesting for us and what makes the tarot interesting is the tarot actually represents kind of a journey. So there's three cards that I think of, and oh look, I just happened to pick these out of this perfectly shuffled deck. These just came up, we'll do a three card spread. The first card is the fool. All right, maybe I do need a volunteer. Come on, someone come on, volunteer. We're gonna be fools together. Yeah, why, why so serious, huh? This is the joker. So the, the fool is the zero card, where the magician is the one. This is actually a zero-based counting system. Here is the fool. Oh. Awesome. Yeah, I totally need a fool. And actually, you are, you're, well, yes, but because you're wearing red on top and green pants, which this guy is too, so that's awesome. Okay, so come on up. Okay, I want you guys to imagine you're doing this. We don't all have to get up and do this, but just imagine you're doing this. Okay, so we're looking off to, this is my left. We're looking off towards the unconscious. We got one foot poised. Our eyes are to the stars. We've got uh, let's see, we got a stick over our shoulder with like a little, what are those things called? A little... A bindle stiff. A bindle, bindle stiff, yes. So the, whatever, okay. So it's in that bag is actually our material identity. It's just slung over our shoulder, which weirds me out. I'm in like a bag full of passwords or whatever. Okay, but just take one, yeah, okay, you got it. And one foot like this, and we're not looking where we're going. But where we're going is, we're, well, that's what makes it the fool, Chris. It's, you're okay. Okay. So, so the fool represents that. All right. You got it. Give him a hand. Very nice. So the fool is the beginner's mind. The fool is that impetus to take that first step, even though you don't know where it's going. Now, our fool might want to 
check because that first step, it's a kind of a mind the gap situation. But the idea is that this guy is fearless. And the only way that learning comes, the only way you learn something new, is if you kind of didn't know it before, but you were open to the experience of learning it. So the fool, the joker, the joker's a wild card, right? What's one of the most powerful tools we have? Wild cards. They're unpredictable, and they are, allow, they are great tools for us in uh, technology, too. Okay, so the next aspect, who has a hoodie? Everybody who has a hoodie, put on your hoodie. Okay, so we had the fool. The fool is the neophyte about to start the journey. The next stop on the journey is the hermit, okay? So, all right, you got, okay, you got your, oh my gosh, you guys are like totally channeling this. Okay, so stand up. That, you can't just let that go to the waist, you gotta stand up. Okay, Dave, you're totally into this. Okay, so right here, you are holding a lantern. You're looking in the same direction the fool was, but now you've got some experience. You've been down that path. Now what you have is you have, <laughs> damn brother. Okay, so you've got, you've got your lantern and you've got a staff. So now when you look, off the cliff, off the ravine, you know what's there. And in fact, you can shine that light and that wisdom. Okay, that's good. Everybody give him a hand. Everybody give him a hand. You've gathered the knowledge and experience, and now you have the ability to, uh, to, to reflect on that and also potentially to share that experience with others. That's the hermit. And I actually kind of think of, when I think about the hermit, if you work with any, like, Really crusty Unix sysadmins, lots of opinions. They'd, any, any suggestion you had, they'd tried it before when you were four. Anyone? Yeah, I know you did. I know we all did. There's a whole, we're a whole generation raised by uh, crusty sysadmins. Okay, so the, we were the neophyte, then we gathered the information, we have the experience, but there's one more. Okay, this is a special request. Can anyone here do a handstand? Okay, all right, we're gonna go a different way then. I was really hoping, I mean, chances were, but okay, all right. I'm, I'll, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Okay, all right, so I want you to imagine you got one knee up, I do, and you have your hands here or behind your back, but you're upside down because you're suspended from a tree. Okay, so this is the hanged man. So this is the sort of third of the trifecta here on our journey, all right? What does the hanged man represent? Well, first of all, that sounds kind of um, scary, but actually the hanged man is, is a person at a crossroads. They need to make a decision. So the hanged man is someone who uh, has the ability to take one of many paths potentially, but they're waiting, they're in stasis. So it's not the beginning of the adventure. They've got knowledge, but what are they gonna do about it? Let's think about that for a second. What is the hangman going to do? So the, this is a very useful card. It's, it's an, the idea is we need to consider the choices that we make, but we can't stay too long at the crossroads or we won't move forward. Okay, so I feel like when I think about these, I think, I think about the fool as being kind of one point and then I think of the hermit as being kind of another point and the hangman as sort of the last point. So you start with the point and then you start connecting the points into a line. But the hangman isn't actually at the end of the journey. The end of the journey is the world and the world is a circle. Okay, so wait before your minds are completely blown, because I saw an eyebrow raise there. You, I think you know where I'm going with this. You go from a point to a line, and then whoa, it's a cycle, it's a cycle. We wrap it around, you got it? Come on, I'm gonna keep doing this until I get some woo-woos and some like, woo! All right, because it's a path. It's a path, and it's, it's one that we may go through many times in our life. Um, as 
I feel like the next stage for us as defenders, we can actually take a lesson from this as defenders, which is um, that we need to follow our curiosity, but we also need to build learning and realize that it's a learning process where we're driving to decisions and then we actually see the results of those and move back. Okay, so this is actually a terrible plug for data-driven security and machine learning. All of those systems depend on having feedback and then going back into the unknown and having this ability to sort of um, have new takeaways and also the potential for error and learning from error. Okay, so with Atero, with the, this idea that the, hero, the, um, the hero's journey that we're on here with these archetypes, we're able to tap into our hacker roots with the magician. But to level up, we really need to walk a path. We were all new noobs once, and we collect subject matter expertise as we go. So the next step is to convert the curiosity plus the information into decision making that yields results and understand that it's a wheel. It keeps on spinning, kind of like the perimeter, which we might want to make spin. So, okay. All right. And that was it for Tarot. Give me a cheer. Give me some clapping. All right. Okay. So now we are at, we did, we did one, which was David and Goliath. We did two, which is the Tarot. And now we are ready for part three. So we had some, we had a battle, we had archetypes, but now we're going to deal with some gods and goddesses. Are you guys ready? Okay, we're ready for the quest and some divinity going on here. Okay, I'm going to need a lot of volunteers. All right, you guys are going to end up being my volunteers. The body of Ganesh. All right, okay, we're going to do a little descent myth. So this is, this is another example of why framing is so important. I'm actually going to take you through, we went through David and Goliath twice, but I'm going to actually take you through three descent myths. And then we're going to, I want to talk about why uh, these descent myths actually were, why I wanted to kind of approach the talk this way. Okay. Let me clear my mind. All right. Okay, so we're going to do the Greek myth first. All right, I need a Demeter, who's the earth goddess, and I'm going to need Zeus. Okay, one of you up there, you're Zeus. You're Zeus. I like it. You are going to be a good Zeus. Okay, so come here. All right, so the descent myth begins with beautiful Persephone who is so gorgeous, she's just walking around, la, 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 la. I'm going to be the devil now, all right? I'm going to be Hades. Yep, I'm kidnapping you. I'm taking you down to the underworld. Okay, so Persephone is stuck in the underworld. Now, I need a Demeter. I need a non-gender specific Demeter. Any one of you is Demeter. Just raise your hand, you're Demeter. You're Demeter. You're Demeter. Okay, Demeter is Persephone's mother. Persephone is so beautiful, and Demeter notices immediately that she's missing. And Demeter starts asking around, have you seen Persephone? Have you seen Persephone? And no one's seen Persephone. Why? Because Persephone is stuck in the underworld with Hades. Okay, well Demeter, her mom, okay, you can be Hades. So Demeter uh, decides that this is, this is not okay, uh, that someone has absconded with, with her daughter, and no one will help her, so she decides she's basically going to uh, do, one of you is Demeter, okay? Cross your arms, you're very mad, because no one is paying attention to what you want to have happen here, so you're going to do a denial of service on the whole earth, no fertility, no ports, no services are being rendered. It's all 404s. Total denial of a service attack, okay? It's a very bad year to be on Earth. So, okay, this upsets a lot of folks. So Zeus, Zeus is like, okay, fine. Um, we actually kind of knew where she was all along. We're going to send Hermes to go get her. You're Hermes. Come on. So Hermes comes down to the underworld, la, 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 la. And he's about, he gets Persephone. He, and he sort of starts to take her away, right? He's going to get her out of the underworld. But, oh, Hades did something. 
He fed her pomegranate seeds, which was basically a matrimonial exploit kit. She didn't even know it, but now she is married to Hades. They're married, right? Okay, so, um, and yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's how that works, right? So, so, okay, so now Hades is like, hey, what's up? This is my wife. And so there's a, so Zeus decides to intercede because Demeter is still really mad. And yes, you've got lightning and you are not afraid to use it. And so Zeus intercedes and he's like, okay, 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 let's come to some kind of compromise. We're actually going to, um, Persephone is going to come out and spend six months of the year with Demeter. And then six months of the year, she's going to be queen of the underworld, hanging out with Hades. Woo-woo! Okay. That was the first one. All right. Good job. Okay. All right. Okay. Ooh, ooh. I got to remember some of these names. Okay. <clears throat> Next up is Babylonian descent myth. All right. Okay. Ishtar. That's you, Lope. You're Ishtar. Up, 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 up. That's you, man. Okay. Ishtar, queen of heaven and earth. Her love, Tammuz. That's you. Yeah, you're going to be her love. Tammuz um, gets killed by a wild boar and dragged down to the underworld and dragged down to the underworld. Okay. So... Ishtar's pretty upset because uh, he is now stuck in the underworld with Arishkagal, her sister. And so, yeah, exactly. So Ishtar, come, come here, because you're not in the underworld yet. So Ishtar gets pretty mad, right? She puts on her tiara. She puts on her necklaces. She puts on her bracelets. And she's going to get ready. She's going to kick down the door, and she's going to get her boy back from Arishkagal. So she descends down the seven layer model, I mean into the seven, seven layers into hell. And at each level though, even though she's like kicking down the doors and she's like, I'm about to get my guy, at each level she gets challenged and has to take off one of her ornaments. Then she gets down to, she gets down uh, and confronts her sister Arishkagal and she's like, give me my guy. Um, Who's, you can be Arishkagal, because you were Hades. Okay, so Arishkagal's like, uh-uh, I'm going to imprison you. And so now one of them's dead, one of them's in jail. I know, it's awful. I know, it's terrible, it's a terrible descent myth. Okay, so now Ishtar, queen of heaven and earth, is imprisoned in the underworld by her evil sister, well not evil, but like underworldy, you know, Arishkagal, and... Ea, the god of water and life, actually, uh, what does he do? Oh yeah, he sprinkles some of his water of life. Keep, the, keep, the, keep that up there. He sprinkles some of that down. I know, I know. To resuscitate Ishtar. <laughs> and then she is able to make her way back up out of the underworld. Yay! Okay, all right, exact same characters for the next one. Don't, don't sit down too quickly. Actually, come back up because you're not in the underworld right now. Okay, now we're going to do the Sumerian descent myth. All right, did you kind of see, though, how what happened with Demeter and Persephone was kind of similar to what happened with Ishtar? Now we're going to do, did you, right? Like they went down, they came back up. Oh, I forgot to mention the part that um, you get to spend six months of the year in the underworld and then you get to come out for six months but you get to be queen of the underworld in addition to queen of heaven and earth okay all right so there's the sort of agrarian cycle gets pulled into the sun myth okay now we're going even further in the way way back machine to the sumerian myth so this is anana she is also queen of heaven and earth yes exactly hey there hey there so anana is a, is interesting because nobody's kidnapped she has no one to go save. She decides she just wants to see what's up. 
She just wants to go to the underworld because she wants that information, okay, right? She has agency. And she puts on her best me. So me is like Sumerian, is a, the Sumerian concept of the ability to do things, like programs. So did any of you read Snow Crash? Because this, this, this myth kind of comes up. Because Inanna actually steals the me from Enki, right? Who is also sort of the god of water and of life and of knowledge. She gets him drunk on beer and she steals the me. These are her superpowers. She puts on her superpowers. She goes down to the underworld. She knocks on Arish Kagal's door and she says, hey, what's up? I kind of just wanted to see what was going on around here and figure out how you do things. And, you know, maybe get some powers myself. And, uh, and, and then I want to, to leave. And Arish Kagal says, um, actually, not so much. Now that you're in the underworld, you're in my turf. I'm going to turn you into a piece of raw meat and hang you on the wall. Yeah, okay. But before Inanna had left the underworld, a lot of folks had told her, don't go down there, because once you go to the underworld, you can't come back. You'll be dead. Uh, I don't know that they thought that she would get turned into a piece of raw meat, but they didn't think that her, her coming back out of the underworld would be easy. So she talked to a few people before she left, uh, including her friend uh, Inshaber. No, yes? Yes, Inshaber. And uh, she kind of let them know, if I'm gone for too long, can you... Uh, <laughs> I like how you're acting all of this out. If I'm gone for too long, send, send someone to get me. So here she is hanging. She's a piece of meat. It's been too long. And so uh, her, hand, her, handmaiden, her handmaiden decides, okay, I'm going to try and go get some help. So she kind of walks around. She kind of asks help. And everybody basically just says, I told you so. So she goes to Anki and she says, okay, this is the, I know you're still mad at Anana for stealing your me, but actually, can you help out? And so Enki's like, actually, this is my favorite granddaughter. She got, me drunk on, or she got me drunk on beer that time, so I will totally help out. I've got some water of life here, which I'm going to sprinkle over here on some uh, dirt, and they're going to turn into um, trolls. They're basically going to, they're bots. They're going to go down into the underworld. They're going to sneak their way in because they're not actually alive. And then what they do is they actually troll Arishkagal. And she finds it charming, because she's from the underworld. And so she decides that she will actually let Anana go free as long as Anana finds someone to take her place. And then the end of this is Anana is able to come back out. And she gets to put her ornaments back on. She gets to take her meat and leave. And when she gets out, she actually realizes that um, she, she doesn't have any friends or family who she wants to send down in her place. But, you know, her husband actually was pretty cool with taking the throne and didn't seem to show any emotion at all to the fact that she disappeared for so long. So she sends him down. And he lives with her sister for half the year, and he comes out back and he hangs out with her for half the year. Okay, so that's a little weird. Um, but I really like the descent myths because they're, what they're really about is this idea of integration. This idea that you can be of heaven and earth, but you also need to confront, which is sort of the material world, the world of the intellect, but you also need to confront your unconscious and integrate it into um, yourself to kind of be a full person. Uh, and sort of the life lesson there is we all have multiple aspects we can draw upon, and we can't shut out pieces of ourselves um, if we're on our way to being a whole person. But the takeaway for defenders is a, is a little bit more uh, practical, though, which is that we each have multiple aspects of ourselves that we can draw on. And something that I think that, because I, sort of I am trying to bring this back to how is this useful to defenders, I really like the acting part and the mythology, but we are trapped in the tyranny of the verses as defenders. And what I mean here is we've got blue team versus red team. We got the business versus security, security versus compliance. And the thing is that all of these folks are our people. And if we're ever hung out to dry like a hunk of rotting meat, I think we're going to need to call upon not just people like ourselves, but other like people who have that impulse to protect. And whether those folks are, are in legal or marketing or PR or compliance or the business, um, it's useful to have allies everywhere because we're stronger together. 
Okay, these are our stories. Now we're gonna wrap up in a big finish. Everybody cool? Get your hands up. Seriously, come on. It raises the energy. Okay, good, good, all right. Okay, so we are the stories that we tell ourselves. And the good news for tomorrow's defenders, I love the wave, okay. The good news for tomorrow's defenders is that we actually have a rich history to draw from, thinking about our hacker roots and thinking about that impulse in us that sets us on this journey that, that, that wherein we want to understand how things work, but we also want to protect things. Um, and those types of stories can inspire an entire career and even, and even a life. So as, as a group of defenders, we are curious, smart, scrappy, innovative, good in a crisis, brave in the face of change, willing to go to battle, picking the right tools, taking the journey, a willingness to go to the underground, deal with the water of life, and come back out, and we're up for a challenge. You like that, all right. So a simple read of the cards we've dealt ourselves says that we are the stories that we tell ourselves. So for defense, inventing ourselves or reinventing ourselves wherever you think we are on that sort of um, journey, it's not a moment of insight, but it's actually a lifetime of work and invention. So the long game is long. I'm looking at you, Wim. The long game is long, right, okay? But, you know, come on out, let's play, and let's be epic. Let's be epic together. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you again, really, for playing along, as I like it better when we are all in this together whether we're talking about the talk or we're talking about life. Okay, um, yeah, that's good. Time for a break or questions? questions. Do you have questions? You have questions, okay, cool. What's my defender story? Let's see, okay. So my defender story is that I am fascinated by the in-between places. And those are, so when I say the in-between places, oh, come on, guys. I don't even know what you're laughing at. I just assume it has nothing to do with what I just said. So the in-between places between disciplines, like between economics and technology. And I feel like the in-between places are where the really interesting things happen and where things break down. So I'm really good at understanding how very complicated systems work and helping design them or architect them in such a way that they can be managed safely. That's my defender story. Thank you. Any other questions? Please raise your hand and I'll come over with the microphone so that people on the live stream can uh, follow as well. Come on people, don't be shy. Yeah, song requests on a little karaoke. <laughs> do, do, I mean, I'm not afraid of anything, so bring it. Is there a karaoke plan one of these evenings? There is not yet. Would you like to be the fool and step into that unknown and kind of help make that happen? Okay. So, locals, are there any really good karaoke places or places where they would give us a microphone and some background music and we could make it be a karaoke place? Right here? Right here, right now? We do have 20 minutes. We do have 20 minutes. All right. Okay. Well, I'm not going to hold you here any longer. The circuit is broken. The circle is open. Let the spice flow.